Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, prosecutors inch closer to potential indictments of Donald Trump. Nikki Haley officially becomes the first candidate to challenge him for the Republican nomination. Democrats quietly and not so quietly worry about Joe Biden's age. Michigan State Senator Mallory McMorrow joins to talk about passing gun safety legislation after this week's shooting at Michigan State University. And Crooked Zone Hallie Kiefer takes us on a meandering journey through Elon Musk's adult mind. (laughs) <laughs> We're covering a lot today. And one more thing before we start, um, because it's President's Day weekend, uh, we will not have a pod uh, this coming Tuesday. So the next pod you'll hear will be Dan and I once again next Thursday. But if you're hungry for some content on Tuesday, you can go to the Pod Save America YouTube channel and uh, watch Tommy and Brian Tyler Cohen do another draft, this time of Fox News Outrages. Let's get to the news. Um <clears throat> A grand jury in Georgia has found by unanimous vote that no widespread fo- that no widespread fraud took place in the 2020 election. Breaking news, uh, and believes that perjury may have been committed by one or more witnesses who testified about Trump's attempt to overturn the election. But that's all we know for now. Uh, Judge Robert McBurney only released parts of the final report after District Attorney Fannie Willis asked to keep most of the findings sealed to protect the ongoing criminal investigation and the rights of the potential defendants in the case. She has also said, however, that charging decisions are imminent. Uh, Meanwhile, special counsel Jack Smith is moving quickly in the federal investigation into Trump's attempted coup and hoarding of classified documents. In the last few days, he subpoenaed Mike Pence of Hang Mike Pence fame, Mark Meadows, and Trump lawyer Evan Corcoran. Uh, That last one is interesting because Smith is trying to get around Corcoran's claim of attorney-client privilege by invoking what's known as the crime-fraud exception, which means that Smith believes that Corcoran's legal services were used to further a crime. Um, Dan, we didn't get him today. Today wasn't the day. We thought that maybe we, we heard that the grand jury, that some portion of the grand jury final report would be released this morning. We thought maybe the day would end with you know, Trump getting frog-marched down to a courthouse in Atlanta. No, we didn't actually think that. But um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, we didn't get much. We got the intro, the conclusion, and then this portion of the report where they said that they do believe some of the um, witnesses lied under oath. Um, anything more we can read into these developments, or do we just have to wait for Jack Smith and Fannie Willis to hold their respective press conferences? It feels like we will continue waiting and... What we should do in the interim is just tweet at Merrick Garland, which seems to be what everyone else is doing this morning. Oh, is that what they're doing? Yeah, yeah people are very upset about this. Yeah, um, no, I'm sure he's reading all your tweets. He's very, uh, yes. he's got, he's he got also has nothing to do with this specific thing, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah, no, just uh, keep bugging. There's, it's like that, remember that jelly bean container we did to raise money for a yeah. fair fight? Yeah. It's, Merrick Garland has one of those in his office for the indictment. So it just it fills with tweets. So when it gets to a certain line, he goes to jail. Look, I think there are a couple of, in all seriousness, some interesting things here that could mean something, could mean nothing. But the fact that it goes out of its way to point that some witnesses lied, and the fact that the one, the one finding of this report is that no widespread fraud happened, which is a precipitating finding that they will need in some of the potential charges that may come. Right. So it feel, this does not mean that no one's getting charged. It, it very well may mean that someone is getting charged at some point in the not-too-distant future. Um. And it is interesting to speculate uh, who may have committed perjury. Some of the witnesses included Lindsey Graham, Rudy Giuliani. Um, I guess uh, CNN's Manu Raju caught up with Lindsey Graham this morning after the report was released and asked him if he's still pretty confident of his testimony that he didn't perjure himself. And he said yes. <laughs> um, I, for a brief second there, I thought you were saying that CNN's Manu Raju had testified. <laughs> I was like, why did you get what caught What a surprise. Up? Yeah, no. The other the other thing that's interesting on the Evan Corcoran uh part of the Jack Smith investigation is that if a judge were to find were agreed with Jack Smith on this, Trumpel within one calendar year have had two attorneys in two different crimes had their attorney client privilege lifted because a judge believed the preponderance of evidence showed that they had been that they had committed a crime. Which is yeah. a, just a wild thing for the front runner for the Republican nomination. And I realize it's tough to keep all the investigations straight. In the Evan Corcoran case, that seems to be that seems to have to do with the classified documents. Um, because uh, it seems like it's possible that when Evan Corcoran released a statement saying, oh, yeah, all the classified documents are back. Don't worry, we don't have any more. 
Um, he may have lied about that. <laughs> <laughs> may, he may have. Well, it, we don't know if uh, Evan Corcoran committed the crime or Trump used Evan Corcoran to commit the crime. We don't know th- that yet, um, but clearly someone committed a Jack Smith thinks someone committed a crime. Um, we also know in back to the Georgia case that Rudy and the fake, the potential slate of fake electors all received target letters, meaning that they were informed that they have been targets of the investigation. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll be charged or indicted, but it does mean that the uh, prosecutors in the case believe that they may have committed crimes. Uh, there's also, we should say, no known communication between the um, DA and and Trump and his lawyers in the Georgia case, and Trump didn't testify there, so who knows? Who knows? Um, how do you think potential Trump indictments might affect the Republican primary that has now begun in earnest? I think that probably a large group of Republican voters will look at this and say, we, we cannot stand it anymore. Our party is too good for this. And they will toss Trump overboard. We're done. We're, that's it. That's what we were looking for. I'm out. Like, we, are like, party like, that, we are the law and order party. We cannot have criminals in charge. We're out. What did Lindsey Graham say right after January 6th? I'm out. Count me out. <laughs> now he's he's he has now he's been endorsed Trump he's been pulled back in as many people often are in two large crime syndicates um i think that we should expect that the maga media which is the most powerful force in republican primaries will rally to trump's defense that to that trump is being persecuted by his political opponents a democratic elected official in georgia the special counsel appointed by the attorney general appointed by trump's most likely democratic president campaign opponent and there will be a rallying to whether that rallying will translate into actual votes. I impossible to say, but I think that there will be a rally that his opponent, his opponents will rally to Trump's side in this environment, much in a very different, completely unrelated context. But when the Republicans went after Hunter Biden as part of the first Trump impeachment, all of Biden's Democratic opponents came right in defense of Joe Biden, rightfully. So now, these are obviously two very, very different cases, but I do think that there will be a rally, a rallying effect around Trump from some of his brothers. They're not going to criticize him for it. I guess it'd be a better way of saying it. Yeah, I was going to say, there's. it seems like there's three options for each of these opponents. They can use the indictments to criticize Trump. They can just defend Trump, or they can try to take a middle ground. Do you think any of them try to take a middle ground on this? Middle ground is what does that look? Be, right? What does that sound like? A middle ground on this? I think a middle. A mid, it's too early to take the middle ground in this race. I think, but what a middle ground would be is to put all all of these legal troubles in the context of the sort of baggage that Trump would bring to the general election and make him a more easy to defeat opponent by Joe Biden. Yeah, I think I, I you could see one of them saying, "Look, I'll, I, I'm not going to criticize the former president. All I can say is that." Um, I'm not under any investigations <laughs> right now and I don't have that kind of baggage and I don't, and I haven't lost, you know, like you could, you could see one of them doing that. Like Larry Hogan, <laughs> like, like put aside Larry Hogan and Chris Sununu, if Chris Sununu were to run right. the sort of people running the anti-Trump lane who have as much chance of being the Republican nominee as you and I, um, <laughs> but of the people who are semi quasi viable contenders for the uh, Republican nomination. I don't think that any of them will take that middle ground. You think Ron DeSantis just goes, just answers and goes right after the Justice Department, says it's a political wind shot? Yeah, uh, 100%. Okay. I think that's probably right. Or I think either maybe there's, so there's two ways that could play out. One is to aggressively go after them as a point of offense for your campaign. And the other one is just how you're going to handle it in questions, right? Where you're going to focus on your own stuff, but whenever you're on TV, you're going to be asked about it, and then that you'll respond to it by attacking the Justice Department, the politicization of the Justice Department, all of that. Well, here's a follow-up question. Um, who will write the first take about how Jack Smith or Fannie Willis just handed Trump the nomination by indicting him? And why won't it be David Brooks? Because it'll be Josh Crushauer. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, you got it. It's going to be Josh Crushauer. Or Hugh Hewitt. I could see Hugh Hewitt doing it, too. Yeah, I get, so I sort of went... There are any group of people in the in the MAGA media could do it, but I was just looking for someone who is at least uh, theoretically and technically in the more traditional media. And that's very clearly, I think, I see that I can see that Axios headline coming right now. One might think that the uh, prospect of multiple indictments against Trump would provide fodder for the twice impeached presidents would be primary rivals, but alas, here's the New York Times headline after Nikki Haley's campaign kickoff this week: 
They're trying to topple Trump, but they barely utter his name. Uh, Haley chose not to hit Trump directly in her speech, opting instead for a series of implicit criticisms designed to persuade Republican primary voters that it's time to turn the page. Let's listen. America is not past our prime. It's just that our politicians are past theirs. We'll have term limits for Congress. And mandatory mental competency tests for politicians over 75 years old. And I have a particular message for my fellow Republicans. We've lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. Our cause is right, but we have failed to win the confidence of a majority of Americans. Well, that ends today. We're ready, ready to move past the stale ideas and faded names of the past. And we are more than ready for a new generation to lead us into the future. If you're tired of losing, put your trust in a new generation. And if you want to win, not just as a party, but as a country, stand with me. Wild that she came out swinging against uh, Dianne Feinstein, huh? <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad. What uh, did you think of Haley's announcement video and, uh, and her speech? Just verbal consultant drivel, just terrible. <laughs> it's a, it's a bunch of sound bites that aren't connected together that don't ladder up into any compelling argument for why her and why not the others. It makes no sense. It is it's it's terrible. It is absolutely terrible. It just goes to show the paucity of political talent that she has and exists in the Republican consultant class. It's terrible. It's a terrible speech. I mean, my next question was, what do you think about her chances? But I guess I got the answer to that, huh? <laughs> well, I actually have a slightly different <laughs> take on that. But I think there is one, and there is one element about Nikki Haley's candidacy that I think is just, just goes to show how just sort of misbegotten the whole endeavor is. Is ever before you, you and I worked for Barack Obama when he was beginning the process of running for president. I have been in the, I've been in, I've been involved with other people who were thinking of running for president, none of many of whom didn't run, none of whom won other than Barack Obama. And the first thing you do in that conversation is you ask what is known as the Roger Mudd question, right? That is That refers to a question that Roger Mudd, an NBC journalist, asked Ted Kennedy in 1979, why are you running for president? And Ted Kennedy just fumbled the question in a way that hampered his, the rest of that presidential run for him. She has no reason why she's running. There is no rationale that is unique to her. You can see it in the – her argument is generational, but her number one opponent is not Donald Trump. It's Ron DeSantis, and Ron DeSantis is of the same generation than her. In fact, he's 13 years younger than her. Yeah. And so like what what are you doing? Your argument is you're electable. You won a solidly red state. Ron DeSantis run – Ron DeSantis just won by a huge margin – a one-time battleground state in this country. It's just there's no there's no why unique rationale for her. And so I think she is everyone who gets into the race has a low likelihood of success. Like that's always true in every race. And there is a world, and I think maybe this is what she is thinking, although her team clearly did not think think it out very well, is is it possible if DeSantis and Trump hammer the living shit out of each other that some third candidate could come up the middle. Yeah. Right. That happens periodically to individual states. That's all John Edwards almost won the Iowa caucus in 2004. Um, but it, there's no historical precedent of that person winning the nomination. And you're going to need something more than just to be the person who is not getting, you're going to need something more than being just being the person who's not being attacked at the, at the exact right moment. I just think she's not MAGA enough for a party that is controlled by MAGA at this point. And that doesn't necessarily mean that Donald Trump wins, but like Ron DeSantis is at least MAGA enough for most of the party um, and can probably, you, you basically, you need a nominee who can attract both the MAGA portion of the party and sort of the college educated Republicans who are, you know, 
mega curious or maybe they're for Trump or maybe they're never Trump or maybe they're sort of kind of for Trump, right? Like that, you need someone who can straddle both of those factions in the party. And Donald Trump has obviously done that in the past. You, you, I could guess that Ronald, that, sorry, I could imagine Ron DeSantis achieving that. I just can't imagine Nikki Haley doing that. Like, I think she had, I think she had a great announcement for a, a 2012 campaign for president. That's what it felt like to me. It felt like the version of the Republican Party that was when Mitt Romney ran for the presidency. And she, what she's trying to, you're right, it's generational. Barack Obama's campaign was also generational, but he had a few more elements to the message than just generational change. Um, she's trying to say, like, look, this is a party of old white men. I am a woman. I have Indian descent. Um, I confronted, you know, racial division in South Carolina, although she never mentioned uh, the most what she's known for as governor, which is taking down the Confederate flag outside the state capitol. I thought that was fairly notable and um, cowardly that she didn't mention that. Um, so you could see her basically the the 2012 autopsy report where it says that the Republican Party will only win if it becomes a more inclusive party and starts like looking younger into the future. You can imagine Nikki Haley trying to run to be the leader of that party. But that party's been gone for 10 years. I think if Donald Trump and and Ron DeSantis are beating each other up in the primary and there's a potential for a third candidate, it, again, it's got to I don't think it's Nikki Haley. I don't think that she's going to be acceptable enough to the base of the party. There's two parts of this that I think are notable. One is it's not just that she's not MAGA enough, and she's not. And she is betwixt and between because she's not anti-MAGA because she worked for Donald Trump and covered up for him for years, but she's also running against him. So you don't have a you don't have a lane. You're not MAGA. You're not anti-MAGA. You're not really MAGA adjacent. What are you? And the other thing is, is it's also not that she's not MAGA enough. She's not interesting enough. Like, what are you saying that is different? She's rerunning Marco Rubio's 2016 campaign. Yes. And that yeah. was an epic disaster. I mean, and and you mentioned she has this extra challenge because she didn't just support Donald Trump. She worked for Donald Trump. So they're going to be the same challenge that um, Tommy and I talked about this on Tuesday that Mike Pompeo <laughs> and Mike Pence will have. Um, this uh, this predicament was uh, fully on display during her post-speech interviews. Uh, let's listen. What specific policy areas would you would you say part with Donald Trump? What I am saying is I don't kick sideways. I'm kicking forward. Joe Biden is the president. He's the one I'm running against. And what I'm saying is you don't have to be 80 years old to be president. How would Donald Trump do on the competency test if uh, at, at 76 years old? You know, I think he did great the last time he did it. I have no reason to think he wouldn't do well this time. President Trump is my friend. I was honored to work with him in the administration. I thought he was the right president at the right time. And that remains to be um, the truth. We had a great conversation. I told him that I was doing this because I thought it was time for a new generation. I thought we needed to leave the status quo and we needed to move forward. Seems like she really nailed it, huh? <sighs> Are they not allowed to do prep before interviews? <laughs> <laughs> like, can no one just can they just go like just dry run a couple of likely questions that might come and prepare an answer maybe? But here, yes, I mean clearly she was not very prepared. What would a good answer have been? This I mean, this goes to what you were just saying, which is the fundamental flaw in her candidacy is the only argument for her candidacy is I'm not as old as this guy. It's not even I'm not as old as him, and also he has a lot of baggage. She's not even willing to say he's got a lot of baggage. Yeah, I, you could pick one. Sp you just you don't need to win the election on this question. You just need to have an answer that doesn't make you sound like a loser. So just pick one issue where you disagree with him. It could be something completely minor, and cite that. Right, like Donald Trump was. I I was honored to serve Donald Trump. It was a privilege. He was a great president. He did these things. I agree with him on a lot of stuff. That's why I worked for him. But there are a couple of things where we disagree. Here is one of them. It could be the Abraham Accord. tax policy. Yeah, it could be the Abraham Accord. It could be That's for Tommy tax Trump. policy. It could be Chinese balloon policy. I don't know. Pick one <laughs> fucking thing and say it. Like even if you wanted to do it, you know, I mean, it could be anything. Right? It could be absolutely anything. Just have an answer. It's just not that hard. But also, also, she does the stunt about the mental competency test, which is such a stunt and obviously a, an attempt 
at a sop to the MAGA base who all think that Joe, Nile, Joe Biden is senile, right? And, and it's supposed to be an implicit criticism of Trump's age. But then they ask her about it. The Fox and Friends ask her about it. And she's like, yeah, I think he took it before and he did great. So now you're saying that you're a new generation of leadership, but that you think that Donald Trump is competent enough to be president and run for president just, again? Then why are you running against him? It is just not, it is like there is three dimensional chess. There's chess, there's checkers and there's whatever the fuck this is, because <laughs> the, like they obviously made a decision to pick an age for the mental competency test that included Donald Trump. Obviously. But then had no answer to the follow up question about it, because if you did want to include Trump, you just would have picked the age of 80. Right. Which is what Joe Biden is. Right. It's, it's like so ugh, bad. It it's is so, so like stupid. I am, but also it's a great example of this is why political stunts that like are dreamed up by a bunch of consultants in a room don't ever work or mostly don't work because they are obviously bullshit. It's like a transparent attempt. It's like it's always too cute by half. And when you and it's fine in a speech, but when you have a follow up question, even from fucking Fox and Friends, what was that Brian Kilmeade that asked her Brian, the question? Brian, yes, fucking, fucking Walter Tim Russell over, over here, here just yeah. nails. Me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Is, what do you, is, I am I am offended. I hate everything she stands for. I hate everything she's done, other than the one thing she did that was great that she won't mention. But I'm just as a political professional, I am offended by this campaign. I feel I feel the same way. I really do. Yeah. What do you think about <clears throat> what do you think about the general um reluctance to criticize Trump from not just Haley, but people like DeSantis? This is something else we talked about on Tuesday. Tommy and I went back and forth on this. I do not, if I was running a Republican primary campaign, which I hope I never am, um, and Liz Cheney, you call it? (laughs) I'm kidding. I would never do that. Flip it, Elijah. Flip it. (laughs) Um, I would not advise my candidate to criticize Trump. That's not what the voters want. I would advise my candidate to differentiate myself from Trump in a coherent way. She doesn't have to. There's no argument right now to come out guns blazing against Trump. You just have to have some sort of answer as to why you, why not Trump. On a debate stage, you, know, you and Tommy had this conversation around DeSantis and whether he sounded like Jeb Bush, whether he should sound like Jeb Bush or whatever else. And I think he, DeSantis does not and should not take the bait from Trump now. On a debate stage, there will be a test. Yeah, that's what I think. Are you tough enough to do it? And Marco Rubio failed that test miserably in 2016 to actually to many people, to Christy, to Trump, to everyone else. Yeah. Marco Rubio, um, th- he thought he had a chance and suddenly he just like finds himself going back and forth with Trump uh, over dick jokes. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> yes. You start off, you yes. start off the great Republican hope and then you end up doing dick jokes. Uh, yeah, you, lo- you lose that. You lose a dick joke competition with Trump. <laughs> 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 and, so I, th- I, so I don't think she should be out there criticizing him. I just be a little more deft about why you, why not him, and be a little more specific. They don't have to be, it does not attack it, not criticism. You should praise the shit out of him. It should be like a positive sandwich for Trump. Yeah. Did a great job as president. We will, every, every Republican should be grateful for everything he accomplished and what he did for our party. He saved us from Hillary Clinton and all these other things that you want to say that make your base feel happy, and then say where you would be different, why you need him. And then implicit in that, and even somewhat, I think relatively explicit, is the electability argument. You don't have to call him a loser, but you have to say we can't afford to lose. Yeah, and she did, and she she's getting, she got into, the, in fairness, she got into the electability argument a little bit when she said we've lost seven of the last eight. Um, we lost the popular vote in the last seven of eight presidential elections. But then I think on another interview in the Today Show, she was asked about, you know, did Joe Biden really win the election? And she did, she went with the old, Joe Biden is president. And we know there's a lot of <laughs> weird things that happened in 2020 in the election because of COVID. That was which is like okay. What are you doing? No. What are you doing? Um, all right. As fun as it is to talk about the mess of a Republican primary, um, we should also mention that it's looking like there probably won't be a Democratic primary. Uh, President Biden and everyone around him has made it abundantly clear that he intends to run for re-election and is in the process of putting together a campaign. Just about all of his potential Democratic primary opponents have ruled out running against him, including two progressives who ran last time, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. In fact, progressives like Warren, Pramila Jayapal, head of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, and Ro Khanna are proudly endorsing him when they've been asked. Um, And yet, and yet, Politico's Jonathan Martin has a piece out today, Thursday, that reflects the concern you hear from almost any Democrat 
you talk to inside and outside of politics, people think Joe Biden is too old to run again, but party leaders are afraid to say so publicly. Uh, Let's start there. Why do you think Democratic officials are afraid to voice their concerns? I don't think afraid is the right word. And let me explain why. One, I think they all like Joe Biden. They have a lot of affection for him. They're very proud of the work they did together over the last two years. They think he's a good person. What's not to like? He, and to his credit, Joe Biden has done his small P politics incredibly well. Like there's an anecdote in the Jonathan Martin story about Angie Craig, yeah. the Democratic representative from Minnesota, who's one of the few people who has publicly called for called on Joe Biden not to run. And she was recently attacked in the elevator of her building. And the first person who calls her, Joe Biden. Yeah. Right? Like he's done that. And so they like him. Two, they know he's running. They've been told he's running. And so to what end would that criticism serve now? Would it convince Joe Biden not to run? No. Would it possibly be used as fodder against Joe Biden were he to run? Yes. And so it's like to what, like what would be the constructive nature of it? And and then there is the third question, which we will get to, which is if not Joe Biden, then who? Well, that's my next question is, so perhaps it is not constructive to be out there just, uh, you know, worrying aloud either uh, via anonymous quote or putting your name on it, uh, about Joe Biden's age, it would be constructive, you could argue, for someone to just go ahead and challenge him for the nomination. Um, why do you think no one has stepped up to challenge Biden? Three reasons. One, primary challenges always come from the ideological flank. Left for the Democrats, right for the Republicans. Joe Biden, while he has not done everything the progressives want, has done a hell of a lot more than anyone thought was possible. And so there is not room to Joe Biden's left for a viable primary challenge. And that's the assessment of Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pramila Jaffa, all the people you said, is how would you run to the left of Joe Biden? And like he hasn't accomplished everything, but a lot of times it's not for lack of trying. It's because of the, the narrow majorities he has. Second reason why no one has challenged him is that primary challengers always lose. Challenges to incumbent presidents have always failed. In addition to failing, they have invariably made that incumbent president Weaker in the general election. Of the four incumbent presidents in modern political history who have lost re-election, three of the four did so after facing a very vigorous primary challenge. Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy, George H.W. Bush and Pat Buchanan. And so there's an assessment that if I run, I will lose. I will make it more likely that Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis becomes president, and therefore my future in democratic politics is over. So it was like, why would a J.B. Pritzker or Gavin Newsom or Gretchen Whitmer or any other people who would almost certainly run in a world where Joe Biden was not running to undertake what is likely a political suicide mission? And let's now, yeah, here's the thing. I I completely agree that uh, it seems unlikely that a challenge would come from the left, partly because Joe Biden as president has done everything within his power. Um, to pass progressive legislation or um, take executive action that progressives have wanted him to take. Um, I think there are there are probably a, a few things you could say, I wish he took executive action on this or that, but in terms of what is legally viable, and we don't even know at this point if the student debt relief um, action is legally viable, he has done just about everything he can. And then we all know, we've all gone through what's happened in Congress. He's passed the most sweeping climate legislation in history. Um, the rest of the Inflation Reduction Act, what it does for healthcare prices, what it does for prescription drug prices, the COVID relief bill, the transportation bill. He's done just about everything that, that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema would allow him to do. Um, and he cannot get around those two. So we have talked about this. Um, so it, I do think that's why a Bernie Sanders has said, I won't challenge him. That's why Pramila Jayapal said, I was skeptical at first, but I'm a fan, you know, and I hope he runs again, right? So you're not going to get the challenge from the left. So then the challenge you could imagine that would be a historical, considering what you just said, would be someone who is younger than him um, and has and shares basically Joe Biden's politics or at least politics that reflect the record that Joe Biden has amassed um, somewhere in the mainstream of the Democratic Party, maybe a little more left than people had expected from Biden. And then you have a series of governors, right? The problem there is... Basically, exactly what we just criticized Nikki Haley for, 
which is the only real thing you can say about your candidacy is that you are a new generation and Joe Biden is too old. And that's it. That's like your whole there's there's not a lot of ideological differences. There's not a lot of policy differences. You could probably find some small policy differences here and there. But mainly you're talking about age. Even electability is hard because Joe Biden just won the last election. And by the way, and Democrats did pretty well in the midterms, even though yeah. Joe Biden was pretty unpopular. Yeah, his the one time voters had an opportunity to render their judgment on Joe Biden's presidency, they it helped him expand a Senate majority and have the most narrow house loss in recent memory. It's, so he was not rejected by the voters. It's just like, I'm not even sure what the electability argument you would make right. is. I don't. So it's like, you. these people are all smart. They all want to be president. <laughs> they would all jump at the opportunity to be president. They've looked at it and there's not a good viable argument that would give them even a modicum of, ch- of chance of success against the president and the consequences for taking it on and failing would be disastrous to them personally. We can have an argument about whether the party is strengthened, the country is strengthened by a primary challenge. And that very well may be. Ex- we have a small sample size problem when it comes to presidential elections. There just aren't that many incumbents who run for re-election. And therefore, you can't draw some statistically significant sample from what I said about how things have played out in the past. But from the personal decision making of those politicians, it's very easy to see how you get to not running in this context. Well, let's talk about why the worry persists, because unlike a lot of things we talk about on the show, it is not a worry that is limited to a bunch of Washington insiders and pundits and strategists wringing their hands and worrying all the time. Nearly every poll shows that an overwhelming majority of all voters and a majority of Democratic voters do not want Joe Biden to run again. Um, And I have seen this myself in all the focus groups I did for the wilderness. No one wanted Joe Biden to run again, and they were all Joe Biden voters, and they all had pretty nice things to say about him and pretty nice things to say about his record. A lot of them were frustrated with the direction of the country, frustrated with inflation, but they were all concerned about his age. Um... Sarah Longwell has been on this podcast and, um, you know, our bad on the clip there, (laughs) but Sarah was saying that, uh, she has done many, many focus groups and heard the exact same thing. And she thinks that like, yeah. And she, and she said at the beginning, the part that we, uh, cut out that she is very grateful for Joe Biden and thinks Joe Biden saved America and thinks that Joe Biden could, you know, beat Trump again, but that anyone besides Trump, that he'd have a problem with and that she thinks that he would lose. Um, now, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that, but there is a lot of data, not just in polls, but from like talking to people where people are concerned about his age. So are Joe Biden and all of the folks in the White House and all the Democratic strategists who just are all getting behind a second run, are they just out of touch with the electorate on this? No, I I think it's worth just for a second unpacking the age issue to what it actually means. Yeah, I think that's and worth. I think there's four elements of it. The first is, is Joe Biden too old to do the job now or in four years? And there is no evidence to say that he is. In fact, Correct. he has done a great job as president. Yeah, there's no in the people who are in the meetings with him. No one makes that case because you would hear it. People heard it about Reagan in his second term. But right now, as we stand here, Joe Biden can do the job and he's doing a hell of a job at it. That is just a fact. The second is, is he too old to campaign vigorously enough to win the election? Like, can he do all the – running for for president is hard. Being president is hard. Running for re-election while being president is really fucking hard. Yeah. Because you don't just go to rallies. You get off the rally. Your national security team has told you that yet another balloon has arrived over the Hudson and you got to shoot it down. (laughs) There's like a lot of shit going on. and. Can he do that? His State of the Union was clearly designed to show people that he can. And how, I think, how he and I think as, as we said last episode, and I think he did it rather effectively during that State of the Union. Very, very effectively. That's the question. That's an unanswerable question right now. And then the third question is, will his age be a political factor? Not can he do the job, but will, can someone make the generational argument against him? Will you be able to say he's too old for the presidency? And as we sit here today, the most likely Republican nominee is four years younger than him. And so in that sense, it's not. And so, and then the fourth reason is, and this really shows up in the polls, is there is certainly a disconnect right now between Joe Biden and younger Democrats. 
They are the group least enthusiastic about him running. They're the group who told posters, pollsters that they're least enthusiastic about the idea of him winning again. They were his toughest constituency in the 2020 primary. And can he get those people to turn out? Now, 2022 suggests some positive evidence that he could, but that that is ultimately the age question. And it's going to be on Joe Biden to answer some of those questions throughout the process of it. But it's hard to make that the basis for a primary challenge. It's just like, as you right. said, it doesn't, I and mean, we actually saw a purely generational argument play itself out in the Massachusetts Senate primary between Joe Kennedy and Ed Markey. And once you got past, I'm younger than Ed Markey, Joe Kennedy, who we love and uh, really, and have got, got to know over the years, didn't have anything else there. And that's how you can see one of these, like a Gavin Newsom or a J.B. Pritzker or, who, or a Whitmer who agree with Joe Biden on almost everything. Like, what happens after that? You're old. No, I'm not old. Or I'm not too old. I have experience. Okay, that's the end of that. Where do we go from here? It gets very challenging. Yeah, and also, when you ask people, do you think he should run again? That is a different question than when you ask people, okay, he's running, and it's Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Or it's Joe Biden versus Ron DeSantis. And then they have to pick. Yeah. And in all of those polls, it's much, much closer. <laughs> then, yeah, they're, they're essentially tied. They're right. Essentially they're all tied. essentially. And and I, again, back to the focus groups, I noticed the same thing. Do you want Joe Biden to run again? No. Do you want Donald Trump to run again? No. What happens if it's Joe Biden and Donald Trump again? And then just about everyone picked Joe Biden, at least in my series of focus groups. So, I also think just on this, one more thing is that you look at Joe Biden's approval ratings, you look at some of the numbers we're looking about, about lack of enthusiasm from running and all of that. And it, it does make me, and that all seems like, kind of scary. Like, and obviously we worry about everything here, but I do think we probably have not updated our priors to account for an era of historic negative polarization where extremism is the central issue of American politics. Because we, all the traditional fundamentals said that we should have gotten our ass kicked in 2022 and we didn't. And I think some of the same, some of the same dynamics, it won't be exactly the same because it's all going to be about Joe Biden. It can't be all about Herschel Walker or anything else in 2024. But there are, I think politics has changed in a way that maybe might obviate some of the traditional concerns you would have around some of these numbers. Well, on that note, the flip side of not a lot of voters and Democratic voters being enthusiastic about another Joe Biden candidacy is there's not a lot of people who are really angry about Joe Biden, right? Like he does not, he is not as polarizing of a figure as a lot of other politicians in either party over the last decade or so. Like, that's just a fact of who he is. And so that could help him too. Look, I, I don't want anyone to walk away from this thinking that we are like sanguine about Joe Biden's candidacy here. Like, yeah, I worry about the performance in a presidential election again in 2024. Of course I worry about this. But when you think about all the other alternatives that we've just laid out, it's pretty clear, like, this is <laughs> this is what's happening <laughs> like this is what's happening. No one is stepping up to challenge him. Progressives are endorsing him. He has done a great job as president, I believe. He has passed a lot of what I hoped he'd pass. Probably he he probably beat my expectations on his legislative agenda. And so you know, and so that's that's what it is. That's what it is. And 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 whether it's Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis, this goes back to the negative partisanship point. Like whoever the Republicans nominate is going to be a serious threat to this democracy, to this country, and a lot of people are going to be a, a lot worse off if um, one of them wins the presidency, especially if it's Donald Trump again. Um, so that's that's where we are. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> it, seems like, <laughs> it seems like a trap. Um <laughs> Before we, we'll talk about this. I'm sure we'll talk about this again. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right to point out that we are not over that we are not overly sanguine about this, or frankly, anything. Right, I'm not sanguine about anything. Right, and I, if you were to say, if Joe Biden were to come out tomorrow and say, I am not running, and we're like, Pete Buttigieg is the nominee, or Elizabeth Warren, or Kamala Harris, I'd be worried about all of them. Yeah, I'm if not, yeah, someone changed the point. Constitution, yeah. and Barack Obama was going to run again, I would be worried because. <laughs> Invariably, every this election, no matter who is our candidate, who is their candidate, is going to come down to something like 100,000 votes over five states. Yeah. That's it. That's how it's going to be. It's going to be decided on the margins. And so we're going to have to worry about everything. 
And it may be age, it may be in this situation that Joe Biden is old. It could be that Pete Buttigieg is young. It could, you know, it could be any list of things. And so just this is the one that Biden is navigating. Other candidates would have other things to navigate. And no one has made a compelling argument that someone else is obviously more electable. Yeah. Put aside everything he's accomplished in the in the the right to go finish the job, as he said, but that's well, there's this candidate who would definitely win in the wings that we're like ignoring out of so we can get Easter egg roll tickets. Like that's not what this is, right? <laughs> Are we gonna get Easter egg roll tickets? Well, we're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Gee, yeah. I didn't know that. I'm gonna go back and edit this segment just to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, when we come back, I will talk to uh, State Senator Mallory McMorrow about the legislation that she's about to introduce. She and her colleagues are about to introduce in Michigan um, to uh, promote gun safety. Pod Save America is brought to you by Outer Known. Today, we want to salute the women's line available at Outer Known. Everyone has those outfits they run to every week. The clothing pieces you know will always look great and keep you comfortable. That's where Outer Known fits in perfectly. Outer Known offers comfortable clothing that you and your partner will want to wear and keep wearing every day. Outer Known is the first brand founded on a total commitment to sustainability. Their products are made from soft, organic, and recycled materials that feel amazing and never go out of style. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. Sustainability is at the heart of everything Outer Known does. It's the driving force behind the brand. Every Outer Known product is comfortable, breathable, it fits great. Designed to make you look and feel great. Sustainably made for a better planet. Outer Known just sent some more clothes. Yeah, they sent some great t-shirts, uh, like a sweatshirt, some of the blanket shirts. Really good stuff. Sent some clothes for Emily. She loves them. Very comfortable, good looking. Outer Known is known for uh, extremely soft sweaters and stylish tops, like the best-selling blanket shirt that Tommy just mentioned. Jumpsuits, that's what they sent Emily. They look great. Denim jeans, uh, fit great, extremely comfy. And they're even guaranteed for life. So go to outerknown.com slash PSA25 today, and you'll get 25% off your first order. That's outerknown.com slash PSA25, spelled O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com slash PSA25 to receive the 25% off discount code. Check them out today, outerknown.com slash PSA25, and don't forget to use the promo code on the page for 25% off. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can do great things, but sometimes... Life gets you bogged down, and you may feel overwhelmed, or like you're not showing up the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Talk about how you feel when you felt out of control in life all the time. Out of control. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp's a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Look, BetterHelp is great. It's a super affordable option. You can get a therapist. You can do it in your own home. You can do it. You don't have to see them by their face if you don't want to. You can jump on the phone if you want. If you don't like your therapist, you can get rid of them at any time. Well, what more do you need? It's great. It's a great option. Give it a try. You have nothing to lose here. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash PSA. To get 10% off your first month, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash P-S-A. Pod Save America is brought to you by Sleep Me. Science proves cold sleep creates better sleep. Temperature-controlled sleep repairs muscles and improves cognitive function, so you can always start your day feeling sharp, confident, and energized. And that's where Sleep Me comes in. Sleep Me makes the coldest sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deep, restorative sleep. These sleep systems are water-based, temperature-controlled mattress pads that fit over your existing mattress to provide your ideal sleep environment. They keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. And they just launched the Doc Pro sleep system with new Hyber AI. You can experience the ultimate cooling power with the Doc Pro sleep system. Pair it with the new Sleep Me app and get real-time temperature adjustments based on your current sleep activity from the new Hyber AI technology. It's the industry's first sleep tech that tracks and optimizes your sleep temperature for you in real time. You get the best sleep of your life with AI-driven technology. Here's the thing. We love Sleep Me. It's really good. It makes you sleep better. If you sleep hot like I do, it helps you cool down no matter what. It's really great. Head over to sleep.me slash crooked to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Uller, or Cube sleep system. 
Software is available exclusively for Podsafe America listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S-L-E-E-P dot M-E slash cricket to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. And we're back. This week, there was yet another horrific school shooting, this time at Michigan State University, where three students were killed and five more were injured. Joining us to talk about what Democrats in Michigan intend to do about this now that they've won back control of the state legislature, Senate Majority Whip Mallory McMorrow. Senator, welcome back to the pod. Thank you. Um, So yesterday, a big group of Michigan State students came to the Capitol to demand action on, on gun safety. Um, They sat outside the steps in rows because that's how they've been trained to sit during lockdown drills. Uh, You were there with them. What did those students tell you? It was really, really moving. I mean, first, it was uh, one student organizer who asked all of the legislators to to come in front and sit in front and just look at all of them, which was really powerful. Uh, And then she asked anybody, any student who was there who wanted to share a story one by one to come up to the microphone. There had to have been at least 100 kids who stayed out there in it was really cold yesterday and really windy, one by one telling their stories. And and one of the things that really struck me was how many of these kids who just survived a school shooting have lived through another gun violence event before, whether it was another school shooting. Uh, A lot of these kids have just survived the Oxford High School shooting 14 months ago. There's a kid who survived the Sandy Hook shooting um, and then everyday gun violence, people who survived suicide attempts or have loved ones or or nearby neighborhood gun violence. And and this is it just washed over you to realize how much of an epidemic this is. Um, You also spoke at that event and shared that your good friend's older brother was killed in the Virginia Tech shooting in, in 2007. I was struck by what you said at the end of your remarks that you felt powerless after that tragedy. Um, What do you say to young people who may feel the same way today? I, you know, it's a hard thing because it it was, as I said in my speech, the older brother of one of my closest friends. So there's always this kind of feeling of guilt that it was a step removed from me. But this was somebody I grew up with who I saw at sleepovers who, you know, when, when we were still in high school and he was in college, we... Uh, tried to get him to get us beer. Um, this was somebody I knew. And I remember when it happened, you know, just watching it play over again and again and again on CNN and the news coverage and and seeing reenactments and animations of where the shooter was and how he got into the classrooms. Um, and then seeing my friend's dad, you know, just screaming in a photo that was on the front page of the Washington Post and just feeling paralyzed. Um, And when I was running for office for the first time a few years ago, in the wake of the Parkland shooting, there were high school kids in my district who reached out to me, even as a candidate, not even somebody in office yet, and asked to get coffee with me, um, you know, at at 8 a.m. on a Sunday at a Starbucks, which is not what I was doing when when I was in high school or or when it happened to me. And they grilled me and they demanded to know what I was going to do on this issue when I got into office. That pushed me to push harder. And it has happened slowly. But the reality is now we have a Democratic majority in Michigan that got to a majority partially on gun violence on all of us committing to do something. So my message to to all of these kids or anybody is that you're not powerless. You know, it is night and day difference from Virginia Tech uh, to now. And in Michigan, we are going to act. Can you talk about what legislation you and your colleagues are preparing to introduce on gun safety? Absolutely. Uh, The bills are being finalized and drafted and being introduced right now. Actually, uh, we are we're on recess to go back into session uh, to introduce them. So there will be a package of bills on three key issues, one to create red flag laws, uh, emergency risk protection order here in Michigan, as well as requiring safe storage of firearms when they are not in use and universal background checks. Uh, These are pieces of legislation that we have introduced multiple times, time after time after time. Um, But we now using the best research and data from states that have enacted these policies already, um, our policy teams 
were already working on these before this horrific event happened. Um, but uh, just credit to staff who I don't, don't think ever get enough credit, uh, stayed up, you know, long nights all of this week to to expedite the the end of this process to make sure that we could introduce them today. So for folks who don't know, uh, it takes two thirds support in both chambers of the Michigan legislature to enact a law immediately. If you have a simple majority, there's essentially a waiting period of about 14 months. Do you think uh, you guys can get any Republican support on these measures that'll be necessary to get to that two thirds number? I do hope we can. There have been some moments uh, in my time in the legislature where where there has been um, bipartisanship in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Uh, a couple of years back, there was a police reform bill that even under a Republican controlled legislature passed out of the Senate unanimously in, in the wake of that crisis. It ended up dying in the state house. But I think that showed me that when it when it hits home and when it is a, a devastating moment, there there's an opportunity, there's a window that opens up for us to actually come together and put our differences aside. Um, Michigan State is four miles away from our state capital. This has not only impacted the families and the kids directly, this is quite literally everybody's staff, everybody's family, everybody's kids. I mean, everybody um, in the Capitol is affected by this. Uh, there were some speeches today from both sides of the aisle about what this meant to them. And this feels like it can and should be one of those moments. Do you envision any issues getting enough Democratic support for a, a simple majority? No. That's great. That's great. Um you know, as I said at the outset, this is the first time in 40 years that the Democrats hold a trifecta in Michigan. What other pieces of legislation are you all looking to get passed uh, in these next two years? Oh, there's I think this is a whole episode in and of itself. But <laughs> I will say, you know, beyond this is an issue that, again, um, I know some of the opposition is going to say that that we are rushing to introduce these bills in the wake of a crisis, but I really want to reiterate, we've been working on these for years and years and years. This was a priority coming in. Uh, but we also signaled as a new Democratic majority that we're tackling a lot. On day one of this new legislature in both the State House and the State Senate, we introduced six bills that include repealing our 1931 abortion ban, uh, expanding our State Civil Rights Act to explicitly include the LGBTQ community, expanding uh, the EITC tax credit to support working families, uh, repealing the pension tax, which is something that uh, Republican Governor Snyder taxed seniors' pensions in order to give uh, big businesses a $1.8 billion tax break back in 2011, uh, and also repealing right to work and restoring prevailing wage. So we came out the gates with a big message that we're going to tackle kind of democratic social issues and economic issues. And Michigan right now is making the case that we are the anti-Florida. Uh, the governor said in the state of the state that bigotry is bad for business. So we are addressing inflation issues, making things better for people's pocketbooks, but also signaling to everybody, you are welcome here in Michigan, no matter who you are, and we're going to protect you. And and gun violence and gun reform is a big piece of that as well. So you got national attention for your response to a Republican state senator who accused you of grooming and sexualizing children because you stood up for LGBTQ kids. Um, the Republicans running for president in 2024 seem to be competing to see who can do the most to marginalize kids based on their gender identity, sexual orientation, or what they learn in school. Um, I think like Pence is going to spend a million dollars in Iowa on some parents' rights bullshitty thing. Donald Trump has a new policy where he's going to try to ban gender affirming care for all minors. Obviously, Ron DeSantis uh, has been doing this for quite a while. What's your advice to Democrats on how to handle these issues and this dynamic that we're going to see play out in the Republican primary over the next year? Well, look, I think you just said it. I mean, these issues that they're running on, they're bullshit. They are an attempt to distract and make people believe that all of their very real issues related to inflation or the economy or jobs or, or education or whatever it is are somehow somebody else's fault. And that somebody else, they seem to be coalescing around the LGBTQ community and trans kids. It is absolute horseshit. And Democrats should call it out, call it what it is, and make that connection. You know, I think that's something that we did um, here in Michigan and, and did it well, is point out that, you know, banning 
two kids every year from playing soccer with their friends is not going to do anything to lower your health care costs or fix the roads or bring teachers back into the profession. And I think if if Democrats stand up and show that, then Republicans have nothing to run on. Uh, last question before I let you go. Uh, speaking of 2024, could be a crowded primary to replace retiring Michigan Senator Debbie Stabenow. Uh, you haven't yet said if you're considering running for that seat. Anything you can tell us? No. <laughs> I had to try. I had to I try. I know. I respect, I respect the attempt. <laughs> Um, Senator Mallory McMorrow, thank you so much for joining Pod Save America and uh, good luck introducing the legislation in a few minutes. We'll we'll let you go do that. Take care. Hey, thanks. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article has everything you need to organize your bedroom, living room and dining room with dressers, nightstands, sideboards and more. Plus, they've got all the other furniture you could want to get your space looking its best. Article believes in delightful design for every home. And thanks to their online-only model, they have some really delightful prices, too. Their curated assortment of mid-century modern, coastal, industrial, Scandinavian, and boho designs. Boho, huh? Makes furniture shopping simple. Article's team of designers are all about finding the perfect balance between style, quality, and price. They're dedicated to thoughtful craftsmanship that stands the test of time and looks good doing it. Article offers fast, affordable shipping across the U.S. and Canada. Plus, they won't leave you waiting around. You pick the delivery time and they'll send you updates every step of the way. Article's knowledgeable customer care team is there when you need them to make sure your experience is smooth and stress-free. We love Article. We got lots of Article furniture all over the office. The couches, chairs. There's a shelf or two, maybe? Sure. Stuff's everywhere. It's great. Looks great. Affordable. Comes fast. It's great. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Pod Save America is brought to you by Smile Actives. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Are your teeth aging you? Popular food and drinks are known to stain teeth. Beverages like coffee and wine stain them over time. So what can you do to brighten your smile? Well, you should give Smile Actives a try. Smile Actives is safe, effective, easy to use and will keep you smiling proudly. Smile Actives is great. It is so much easier than those stupid strips that people use. No, those are very painful. And going to the dentist to get it whitened is also painful and expensive. No one likes a dentist. And a pain in the ass. So Smile Actives is easy. You just squirt your toothpaste on your toothbrush, squirt a little Smile Actives on there, and that's it. That's all you have to do. Very easy. Uh, 97% of Smile Actives users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. Visit smileactives.com slash crooked today to receive our special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery and free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash crooked. Terms and conditions apply. See site for details. Pod Save America is brought to you by Keeps. Two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35, but Keeps can help. Keeps offers a simple, affordable, and stress-free way to keep your hair. They got expert recommended hair loss treatments, personalized treatment plans that are recommended by a licensed medical provider and delivered straight to your door. With Keeps, you can get quality expert care without ever visiting a doctor's office or pharmacy. Easily subscribe to Keeps and get refill reminders so you'll never run low on the products you need to take care of your hair. They got 24-7 care and support. Each treatment plan comes with a full year of unlimited messaging so you can connect with your medical provider about anything, anytime. Treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps has got you covered. Remember, prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so act fast. If you are ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash crooked to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps.com slash crooked to get your first month free. keeps.com slash crooked. All right, before we go, uh, Crooked Zone Helly Kiefer is here. Um, I guess we're doing something with Elon Musk's tweets. We are. Okay. Um, you know, we wanted to do a little twist on the form and just to establish, you guys are, you're over OK Stop. Yeah. We're over it. Way over it. And, you know, unfortunately, the audience loves it. They're constantly asking for it. And you guys said, never again. Don't even bother. <laughs> OK? And it is sort of like, even though we've given up on it, it's like the old story of Pagliacci, the clown. You know, it's like, doctor, I'm depressed. It's like, oh. I have something for you. Go listen to Pod Save America. They've got a great segment called OK Stop. 
Doctor, I am okay. Stop. This is okay. Stop. It's just a verbal version. I'm just going to tell you the story, <laughs> and then you guys will tell say okay. Stop. And I was reading this, and it is about um, Elon Musk. And uh, going through this, it really um, it felt like I was telling a horror story. <laughs> and so I'm going to call this again. We can change the title later. I'm going to call it Tales of Online Terror. Okay. I like this because <laughs> I'm going to tell okay. you a spine tingling story, and then you tell me when you want to stop and scream. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, before we go, did you guys watch the Super Bowl? Are you Super yes. Bowl boys? Okay. I mean, I don't know if <laughs> yeah, I, we I, I was yes to the first question, no to the second question. It's Am entirely I a Super subjective. Bowl boy? It's totally subjective. <laughs> but you had strong feelings about it. Uh, no, I didn't really have strong feelings about it. I don't, I don't like the Eagles that much, but that's about it. Did you tweet at all? Did you? Were you putting anything on the I did, internet? I, I did some tweeting. Um, well, I personally, uh, watched only the halftime show with Rihanna, and then I watched the Puppy Bowl, which is the perfect amount of the Super Bowl. However, the story begins when cosmic flop Elon Musk discovered that his Super Bowl tweet got less engagement than President Joe Biden's. And I'm going to just describe the tweets to you because they are just the most nothing tweets. Like, these are not tweets, but it's like, that people needed to know. Biden, it's a video of Dr. Jill Biden in an Eagles jersey, and then Biden just says... As your president, I'm not picking favorites, but as Jill Biden's husband, fly, Eagles, fly. Cute. Yeah. Totally benign. Appropriate. Elon Musk. This is the tweet that inspired this whole saga, which, by the way, he deleted in shame. Apparently, it's not up anymore. It just said, go Eagles, exclamation point, with six American flags, which felt like it could have been a Biden tweet. I was like, that could it could have been either. It's a, That's just the most anodyne possible. Exactly. Okay. For those of you keeping score at home, go outside. Don't do that. <laughs> but for us who cannot do that, apparently Elon's pro Philadelphia Eagles tweet got 9.6 million impressions. So we're just talking impressions compared to Biden's 29 million impressions. According to a report from Platformer, Elon was so enraged, he immediately boarded his private jet, which, by the way, is destroying the planet, flew to San Francisco and demanded his staff fix the issue or they'd be fired. A fact that makes me want to destroy the planet. Gentlemen, are your spines tingling yet? How does that strike you? What? Did he fly directly from the Super Bowl right. where he was in a box with Rupert Murdoch? Is that where he flew from? Allegedly, yes. Yeah, I saw the picture of that. Um, wow. Doesn't that feel like it should just be an email? Am I wrong? Doesn't it feel like you should not have had that concern in any way? Because you're... What the fuck? Because right. What's the point? What's the point of le- of over leveraging yourself to buy a forty four million dollar fa- billion dollar failing company if you get poor engagement on your tweets? I mean, I think it's, Dan's the, Dan's got the point. But he put in. But here's the thing: he didn't put any effort into that tweet. It's not even like it was. That's a, the point of like, owning the company. The rest of us have to think hard about what can go viral. He shouldn't have to think well, hard. Yeah, he is. Wow. Could you imagine if you owned a restaurant and had to wait for a table? That's ridiculous. He is like the epitome of the tech founder personality where you do mm-hmm. something and you just are used to everyone around you being like, oh, sir, that's amazing. You did it. Oh, you're changing the world. Absolutely. Incredible. Incredible job changing the world. <laughs> it's I know of- this is about Elon Musk, but can I just go on one slight tangent? Sure. Absolutely. I feel like the White House lawyers are being overly careful with Joe Biden that he, a guy who's grown up rooting for the Eagles, can't just root for the Eagles. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's the White House lawyers or do you think it was like his political team? Not that I thought that like they they don't think he doesn't he doesn't need Kansas City. So. Yeah, it's not the Eagles against the Atlanta Falcons, right? Right. Or right the yeah. Arizona Cardinals. It's this is a, this is a layup. Just be for Look, the Eagles. People he cares like, about he cares about Red America, even if Red America doesn't care about him. That's Joe Biden's message. Okay, there you go. All right, back to Elon Musk. Sorry. <clears throat> In the grave of night on Monday morning. Twitter engineers received an urgent at here Slack message that said, we are debugging an issue with engagement across the platform. Any people who make dashboards and write software, please can you help solve this problem? This is high urgency. If you're willing to help out, please thumbs up this post. Gentlemen, 80 engineers had to gather after that Slack message went out. They gathered at the Twitter office to begin working through the night. When was this message sent? To... 36 a.m. <laughs> These people who are human beings with families, <laughs> hopes and dreams, sleep schedules, maybe even children, had to go do this. Is your skin crawling? If you are still at Twitter right now, my question is, do you have hopes and dreams? 
Do you have sleep schedules? Like you can't anymore, right? You I want to know. I also want to know which engineers declined to give the thumbs up emoji. The ones that I have one foot out the door. The ones who are like, my fourth interview is tomorrow, and I'm pretty <laughs> sure. So do we think that 80 engineers showed up at Twitter headquarters, whatever's left of it, at um at like three in the morning to try to start fixing this engagement issue? I mean. I do believe that because I think, unfortunately, that's where they're at. <laughs> now, if you guys were to slack me, I'd be asleep. I wouldn't even get it. That's what's hard is like they got the message, which means that they know that this is happening all the time. That's the terrifying they, part. Yeah, they have sounds enabled on their yes, Slack messages. which is really In the sad. general channel. Ugh. According to reports, Elon Musk then ordered his engineers in the middle of the goddamn night to build a system that boosted his tweets to all Twitter users or else they'd be fucking fired. And then they adjusted the algorithm that would, quote, green light all of his tweets to bypass Twitter filters and boost them by a factor of 1,000. <laughs> Basically, his tweets were receiving special treatment that no other user could ever or has ever received. And without any of us knowing about it, are your bones chilled, gentlemen? Are you, are you, are you, are you chilled? I am to the core. I am... Because this, to me, this is we're, at this point, it's insidious that we don't know what's happening. Isn't that so, terrifying? So, so Twitter has become just like affirmative action for Elon Musk, Musk's tweets. To That's go the back, whole thing. <laughs> to go back to Dan's point about owning a restaurant, it's like if Elon Musk bought a restaurant and then he started making the chicken parm, and then was <laughs> mad that everyone was like, "This is not as good as anyone else's." As Joe Biden's chicken parm. <laughs> and so we hired eighty chicken parm engineers to come in. <laughs> And for not even make his chicken parm better, force people to eat it. Yeah, That's except, terrifying. Yeah, except he was making the chicken parm with like hamburg and ravioli. Like, I, right? There's no chicken in there's it. No chicken. Yeah. Is there chicken in it? No. It's just it just says go Eagles. Right. But I'm it. <laughs> so as a result, Elon's tweets then sort of insidiously started taking over people's timelines this week. Not mine. I haven't blocked. When people started asking why his tweets were flooding their timelines, he tweeted. Please stay tuned while we make adjustments to the uh algorithm. That makes me want to scream in horror. Gentlemen, what are your thoughts about this? Like morally, ethically. Oh, I mean, I don't have any moral or ethical thoughts about Elon Musk because I think he left yeah. those, that behind long ago. I um I have not noticed more of his tweets. Mm -hmm. I st I, I had like a fascination probably a, a bit of an bordering on a bit of an obsession with Elon Musk and his terrible tweets when he first took over the platform. I left that behind a couple months ago. Yeah. And I haven't muted him or blocked him, but I but I don't pay attention to his shit as much anymore, and my life's been better. And I think that is the problem. Yes, Dan, you, you wanted to take issue with what I just said? I was just going to ask if the producers could go back through your timeline. I know. The last time you tweeted Elon Musk was, I think it was well, like Saturday. I, <laughs> it was this. It was, This was the first time in a while because I I heard about this story that you're reading here, and it's um it was it was bone chilling. Well, and then we could sort of talk about that because um we – that's also on my list that Elijah gave me. Basically, sort of, um, you know, this isn't his mo his only bad recent take. You know, we have the whole uh, Paul Pelosi hammer story that he just sort of carried water for. The classic, yeah. Um, you remember when Paul Pelosi, an elderly man, was attacked by a disabled with a hammer and everyone on the right laughed about it? Yeah. Um, so he put out a tweet saying, some of the smartest people I know actively believe the press, dot, 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 amazing. Even though he was posting from something that was just pretending to be a news outlet, and so, obviously, you had a reaction to it, and also you have a podcast about being less online. Um, what? If, <laughs> <laughs> like, sort of like, I guess, like, what do you want people? What should people take from this? Or is it just sort of like uh, the raw icy terror at the whole thing? It's just sort of like I can't even, you know, talk about it. He's just such a. Um, I mean, look, <laughs> he he doesn't want he, Elon Musk just wants doesn't want people to believe anything negative about Elon Musk. It is all it's like it's so, so hard. it is just it, we are reliving the whole Donald Trump yes, absolutely. era again except he's like a poor imitation of Donald Trump not running for office that just controls Trump's old favorite platform. And that's all he is really. You know, and it is like he's running for just our attention. And even that, he's he can't for, do it. You no, know, he can't even. That's the sad part. He paid $44, million, $44 billion to get our attention. And now he has, and he captured it for a brief moment. And now he's mostly lost it. And now he doesn't know what to do because he's just $44 billion in the hole. So I have three takes on this. One Hell is, yeah. it's deeply sad. Yeah. Right? Here is a person who- But kind of funny. Was at one point- <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's funny set, right? Which is he was the richest human being in the world at Jesus. one point. So he's built multiple successful companies. Is upset that his tweet got less RTs than Joe Biden's. Yeah, like that's just like that just speaks to everything about how like this gaping well of insecurity and emptiness inside this human being. Yeah, but, which we can laugh at because he's the richest human being in the world, mm-hmm. or was at some point. Second point. Ultimately, who cares if we all have to look at more of Elon Musk's tweets? It's not like Twitter was this curated list of wonderfulness and now we got to look at Elon Musk shit. Mm-hmm. But the serious part is if he is playing with the algorithm, it's Elon Musk, Musk dumb tweets now, it's pro Ron DeSantis content yeah. later. It is something mm-hmm. else that fits with his – it could be something that promotes Dogecoin or some other financial – like there is a inherent corruption, which then speaks to the, the more important point, which is – if Elon Musk can make 80 engineers change the algorithm to promote mm-hmm. his tweets, then we need some sort of regulation that prevents them from changing it to promote all kinds of other corrupt and dangerous stuff. And that's where this problem this that is the serious point to this absurd story about an absurdly small human being. Or, you know, failing to get that regulation, which probably we will. Yeah. Um, everyone should just sort of uh, stop treating Twitter as uh, the media's assignment editor. And so we, that's why, that's what Mastodon is for. That's what Matt, and anyway. Okay. Fewer tweets, right more tweets. The, yeah. the, the end to this story is go sign up on Mastodon. Um, <laughs> and there, there's one, I think it speaks to your, your point, Dan, which is the final, uh, apparently a story also uh, reported by Platformer that Musk fired one of his last two principal engineers after they told him his tweets were declining partly because people just cared less like it's like you you bought it the months have gone on people are just sort of not really it, back it's not like business as usual but like you know people have all their stuff going on and isn't that the most horrifying thing of all and apparently uh, musk had said like why are my tweets not reaching everybody and he told them this is ridiculous i have more than 100 million followers and i'm only getting tens of thousands of impressions and when this person tried to explain to him how waning attention works he told the engineer you're fired you're fired is this scary or is it just humiliating or is it worse, a combination of the two? I think it's the best day of that engineer's life. They're they're finally free. They're free? They're yeah. finally free. They're free. Um, I want to close it out. Also, if that engineer would like to come on offline. Please. Please come on offline. Um, We'd love to talk to you about your experience at Twitter. And we just want to show you at the end a very grim little video of Elon talking (laughs) to his, I mean, honest to God, uh, three of the remaining employees who I really feel, I do feel for those people, like, whatever situation they're in, it's like, it's not good. You have to get up at three in the morning to do something insane every night. And just, uh, if you're listening, they're sort of in a sterile, blazingly white office space. Like, there's no (laughs) color. It's on, the lights are so bright. Probably to dry, again, ruin their sleep. Um, and, and here we go. If you wouldn't mind playing it, uh, Phoebe. Yeah, exactly. It's the whole point of a meme. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And typically you like the, the meme too that you'll post. And so people know where it's coming down. He's belonging to people. Yeah. <laughs> you create your own memes though, don't you? Uh, I saw you create some memes. Um, your, your meme game is strong. Thank you. Yeah. Your meme game is strong. Yeah. Yeah. I create some memes. Uh, I create some memes. Again, the richest man in the world. 51 has damn near a dozen children. <laughs> this is what we're doing with our time. Guy sucks. That's all That's all I'll say about that. Thank Guy you. It, the, the whole thing is an argument for more touching of grass. Um, and and progressive taxation. Hell yeah. On that note, th- yeah. gentlemen, thank you for letting me tell you this terrifying, spine-tingling tale. Thank you for scaring the shit out of us. It's something about it. Thank you. I don't know. We could all. I, it's like it's better to laugh because if, if I think about it, I'm like, well, that's... that's it's not good that someone could turn out that way. It's, it's not, not good, good at all. all my have friends. that much money. No, 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 no. Maybe billionaires shouldn't exist. Um, on that note. <laughs> on that note, thank you, Helly Kiefer. Of course. Thank you for having for me. For telling us that bone chilling story. Thank you to Senator Mallory McMorrow for joining us. Everyone have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. We are excited to share that the first book from our very own Crooked Media Reads is available for pre order today. The novel is called Mobility by Lydia Kiesling, who also wrote the incredible book, The Golden State. Uh, We've been fans of Lydia's work for a long time. I think Friends of the Pod are going to love this book. Mobility is gripping and hilarious. It's one of those novels you'll nag all your friends to read. Uh, It's part coming-of-age story and part indictment of capitalism and the oil industry. It moves between Houston, Athens, and Azerbaijan, and it tracks themes of class, power, politics, and desire all through the life of a very compelling character, Bunny Glenn. 
Uh, the book has already earned outstanding early praise. Pulitzer Prize winner Geraldine Brooks called it, quote, a masterpiece of misdirection and a cautionary tale for our times. Pre-order mobility at www.crooked.com slash mobility or wherever books are sold so you can be the first to read it when it's released on August 1st.